Arthur, as you watched uh, Peter Snell race, did you have many anxious moments or were you perfectly happy? Well, we had the race all planned and I was waiting for him to go at 200 and, and uh, when he was jammed at 200, I, I really had some bad moments. I don't mind telling you. And uh, no one could convince me that he'd won from where I was sitting. I, I honestly thought he lost the race. On a summer's evening in January 1962, Cook's Gardens attracted the world's attention when Kiwi athlete Peter Snell broke the world record for the mile on its grass track. He then shattered the world 800 metres record the following week in Christchurch. Snell had a remarkable career, winning a gold medal in the 800 metres at the 1960 Rome Olympics and gold medals in the 800 and 1500 metres at the 1964 Tokyo Olympics. Snell was a protégé of Arthur Lydiard, whose innovative coaching system incorporated distance, stamina and speed training to produce a number of record-breaking runners as well as stimulating the international growth of jogging. Snell's Whanganui win was achieved in trying circumstances. His problem began before the race started. Privately, he felt he had a good chance of running the first sub-four-minute mile in New Zealand, but when he arrived in Whanganui, he discovered that Lydiard had already told the press that he expected Snell to run three minutes and 55 seconds, and the race itself did not go as Snell had planned. When the gun shattered the tense silence, I didn't leap away with my usual keenness. Normally I would have jockeyed for a suitable position fairly near the front, but this time, taking the view that there were plenty of others in the race to help me, I decided to sit well back. When we passed the first quarter mark, I heard 61 seconds called, this was still reasonably within the four-minute schedule, so I wasn't unduly disturbed. Halfway through the second lap, Snell was third to Barry Cossa and Murray Halberg, whom Snell hoped would be his pacemaker for the third lap. Then Murray dropped two yards on Cossa. I had to leave him and go past to get a close trail on Cossa. He was doing a tremendous job, and two minutes was called as we passed the half mile. I moved up to Cossa's shoulder and glanced back to see who was coming through for the third lap. All I saw was a large gap. I moved into the lead myself, determined that I would make the three-quarter mark in three minutes. At the three-quarter mark, Snell was on track to beat four minutes. But then, to his surprise, Bruce Tullow raced into the lead. Even though it came from the runner I'd discounted, this was the stimulus I needed. As we swung into the back straight with 300 yards to run, I had him covered. I wasn't worrying about him. I was racing time, not Tullow. At that point I abandoned the studied relaxation of my running and let go with my finishing drive. This is the moment when you stop consciously controlling what you're doing and pour everything into driving out the utmost speed. I found myself running in complete freedom from restraint. I don't think I've ever felt such a glorious feeling of strength and speed without strain as I did during that final exhilarating 300 yards. I knew I must be well within four minutes as I raced the last curve. I straightened heard for the first time the rising roar of the crowd and kept on driving. Following Snell's win, confusion reigned. Snell knew he'd beaten four minutes, but it was some time before either he or the crowd understood that he had run the mile in three minutes, 54.4 seconds, a new world record. Snell's Whanganui run is commemorated by a life-sized statue of him near the Cook Street entrance of the gardens, looking towards the finish line.